Douglas, affectionately known as Dougie by his family, was bubbling with excitement for the upcoming summer vacation at their family's cabin nestled in the heart of the Anirondack Mountains. As his ninth birthday approached, Dougie was embracing a newfound state of independence, slowly shedding the image of a young child. His blonde hair, bright blue eyes, and a wide, beaming smile made him a particularly enduring figure. Despite a slight speech impediment, Dougie's enthusiasm and determination were undiminished, especially when it came to his adventures in the wilderness. Growing up visiting his family's cabin, he had developed a profound love for the natural world, earning him the affectionate nickname of Mini Woodsman from his family. The Adirondack Mountains, located in northeastern New York, are a rugged, forested wilderness known for their breathtaking beauty and challenging terrains. Among the notable features of this region are the Adirondack 46ers, a group of 46 peaks that rise above 4,000 feet in elevation, offering stunning vistas and challenging hikes for enthusiasts. It was against this backdrop of natural splendor that Dougie's family's cabin stood, a grand structure built in 1891 and part of a luxurious, sprawling compound encompassing nearly 13,000 acres. This compound, far from being a modest woodland retreat, boasted a staggering 40 buildings, including a grand 24-room main lodge and a fully operational model farm. Dougie's mother, May Melvin Legg, had an enduring connection to this idyllic preserve, having spent her own childhood summers exploring its vast expanses. She cherished the tradition of bringing Dougie to this special place every summer, sharing with him the joys of nature and the serenity of the forest. The summer of 1971 was no different. The extended family gathered at the compound, immersing themselves in the tranquility and beauty of the Adirondack wilderness. On July 10th, as the family settled into the rhythm of their vacation, Dougie's uncle set out for a hike through the well-trodden paths of the forest. Dougie, eager to demonstrate his growing independence and skills as a young woodsman, quickly joined his uncle on this excursion. The hike, however, was interrupted by an unexpected encounter with a large patch of poison ivy. Concerned for Dougie's safety, his uncle advised him to return to the campsite to change out of his shorts into pants. They were about a half a mile away from the camp at this point. Dougie turned back, embarking on the familiar, well-marked path to the campsite. Yet, in a turn of events that would forever haunt those who knew him, Dougie never made it back to the camp or to his uncle. The alarm was raised when Dougie failed to rejoin his uncle or appear at the campsite. A search party was hastily formed on the night of July 10th, as temperatures ominously dipped into the low 40s. The initial search party, now swelled to 30 people including family, friends, and law enforcement, combed the area under the light of flashlights and lanterns, calling out for Dougie. But the night yielded no sign of him. In the days following Dougie's disappearance, the search efforts intensified. The local community rallied together with residents, college students, camp counselors, and employees of New York Conservation Department joining the search. The U.S. Air Force provided aerial support, scouring the vast wilderness from above. Bloodhounds were brought in, and infrared technology was used in the hopes of locating Dougie. Yet, despite these extensive search efforts, the boy remained missing. A glimmer of hope emerged when a bloodhound picked up a scent that led to a swampy pond. The pond was drained and meticulously searched, but no trace of Dougie was found. Later, sneaker tracks, believed to be Dougie's, were discovered near Ward Pond, two miles away from the campsite. However, a rainstorm swept through the area, erasing any further traces and hampering the tracking dog's efforts. In a move born of desperation and determination, Dougie's family enlisted the help of over 20 experienced mountain men from the California Sierra Madre Mountains, renowned for their tracking skills and wilderness expertise. This skilled team scoured the forests and mountains, but their efforts, too, proved fruitless. As weeks turned into months, the search gradually wound down. The community, once united in hopeful determination, now faced the grim reality of an unsolved mystery. 
The State Department, after six weeks of relentless searching, made the difficult decision to call off the official search operation. The lack of evidence and concrete leads left the case of Dougie's disappearance shrouded in mystery. There were many theories in the absence of tangible clues. Some speculated that Dougie had become lost in the dense forest and succumbed to the elements, while others whispered of possible foul play or an unfortunate encounter with local wildlife. However, these theories remained mere speculation in the face of inconclusive evidence. The police conducted thorough investigations, but found no reason to suspect any family members or residents within the community. The mystery deepened, leaving more questions than answers. As the time passed, the once vibrant and joyful family retreat became a somber reminder of this tragedy. The cabin, filled with memories of laughter and adventure, now stood as a monument to Dougie's inexplicable disappearance. The family, grappling with their loss and the haunting absence of closure, made the heart-wrenching decision to sell the property. It was transferred first to the Nature Conservancy and later to the State Forest Preserve, ensuring its preservation as a natural sanctuary. The once cherished family getaway was transformed into a symbol of childhood lost too soon. The impact of Dougie's disappearance resonated beyond his immediate family, leaving an indelible mark on the community and everyone involved in the search efforts. The locals, who had joined hands in a united effort to find the young boy, were left with a sense of collective grief and unresolved sorrow. Year after year, as anniversaries of the disappearance came and went, the mystery of what happened to Douglas Legg continued to perplex and sadden those who remember his case. The story became a cautionary tale, a reminder of the unpredictability and often harsh realities of nature. It also served as a testament to the strength and resilience of a community in the face of adversity. But most importantly, it remained a lingering question, an unsolved puzzle in the vast wilderness of the Adirondack Mountains. The mystery of Dougie's disappearance is not just a story of a missing child, but a narrative that underscores the deep bonds of family and enduring strength of community and the profound impact of one life, however brief, can have on so many. To this day, the tale of Douglas Legg is whispered among the trees of the Adirondacks, a ghostly reminder of a summer day that turned into a lifelong puzzle, a mystery that nature itself seems to have swallowed, leaving behind only memories and the external question of what happened to Dougie. The mysterious disappearance of Dr. Maurice Doc Demetz, who was last seen on April 29, 1981, in the Devil's Head area of Pike National Forest is a complex case surrounded by numerous unanswered questions. Doc, then 75 years old, was an avid topaz hunter, a hobby he passionately pursued despite his advanced age and physical limitations due to arthritis and a blood disorder. On a fateful spring day, Doc and his friend David McSherry set out for a topaz hunting expedition in Pike National Forest. This sprawling forest, spanning over a million acres, is not only known for its stunning natural beauty and historical landmarks, but also for its rich deposits of minerals and gems, including topaz. Their destination, near the scenic Rampart Range Road, was a prime location for such an activity. The unpaved road, famous for its breathtaking views of the Rockies, was also the site of the Devil's Head Lookout Tower a historic landmark, and a significant point of interest in the region. Doc was appropriately dressed for the excursion, wearing a white baseball cap, a maroon plaid flannel shirt, brown ankle-high work boots, and blue overalls. Given his physical challenges, McSherry assisted him to the chosen spot for topaz hunting. After settling Doc in a comfortable spot, McSherry moved about 50 yards away to explore a different area. Upon returning, McSherry was met with an inexplicable scene. Doc had vanished along with his topaz hunting tools. The absence of struggle signs, disturbances in the dirt, or any indication of a wild animal attack only deepened this mystery. McSherry's immediate response was to search the area and check their vehicle, but there was still no trace of Doc. 
The search operation that was initiated by the Douglas County Sheriff's Office was extensive and involved search dogs, grid pattern searches, and numerous volunteers. Despite these concerted efforts, no evidence or clues were found. The search dogs, notably, were unable to pick up any scent, a fact that compounded the mystery of Doc's disappearance. The distress of Doc's wife, Myrtle, led her to write Governor Richard Lamb, expressing her fear that her husband might have met with foul play or had been forcibly taken from the area. She requested a more thorough investigation into his disappearance. However, no new leads or evidence emerged, and in 1990, Dr. Demetz was officially declared dead. The circumstances surrounding Doc's disappearance raise several questions. His physical limitations make it unlikely that he wandered off or covered significant ground unnoticed. The terrain's complexity and his health condition further diminish the possibility of him moving far from the spot where he was last seen. The simultaneous disappearance of his tools adds another layer of intrigue to this case. Speculation about what happened to Doc ranges widely. Theories include an accidental fall that left him hidden or incapacitated, an unexpected medical event, foul play, or even a deliberate disappearance. However, without concrete evidence, these theories remain just theories and speculative. The case of Dr. Maurice Doc Demetz stands as a reminder of the mysteries that nature can hold and the limitations of even extensive search and rescue efforts. The case of Doc, who vanished in 1981 during a topaz hunting trip in the Pike National Forest, serves as a solemn reminder of the unpredictable and often inscrutable nature of the wilderness. Doc's disappearance, shrouded in mystery, underscores several important lessons that are relevant today as they were four decades ago. Firstly, the case highlights the inherent risks associated with outdoor activities, especially in vast, rugged terrains like national forests. Even for experienced enthusiasts like Doc, the wilderness can present unforeseen challenges. This underscores the importance of safety measures, such as always informing others of your specific plans and staying within known, safe areas, particularly for individuals with physical limitations. Secondly, Doc's disappearance brings to light a vital role of comprehensive search and rescue operations. Despite the extensive efforts undertaken in this case, the lack of clues or evidence points to the complexity of such operations in expansive natural environments. It reminds us of the importance of continuous advancements in search and rescue techniques and technologies, including better tracking methods and more efficient coordination during searches. This case also touches on the emotional toll faced by families of those who go missing. Myrtle's plea for a more thorough investigation reflects the profound distress and lingering uncertainty that families endure. It's a stark reminder of the need for empathy, support, and ongoing communication with the families of the missing during such trying times. Moreover, Doc's case serves as a cautionary tale about speculations and theories that often arise in the absence of concrete evidence. While it's natural for the human mind to seek explanations, this case illustrates how speculation can range from plausible scenarios to far-fetched theories. It underscores the need for careful, evidence-based investigations and the avoidance of jumping to conclusions without solid proof. Lastly, the mystery surrounding Doc Demetz's disappearance reminds us of the fragility of life and the unpredictability of fate. It encourages us to appreciate our surroundings, take precautions, and cherish the moments we have, as the turn of events in life can often be unexpected and unexplained. While the mystery of Doc's disappearance remains unsolved, it continues to teach valuable lessons about safety, resilience, and the complexities of search and rescue operations. Also, emotional journeys of the families of the missing and the importance of remaining grounded in evidence when confronted with the unknown. Now we'll delve into the mystifying disappearance of Paula Jean Weldon, an 18-year-old art student at Bennington College in Vermont. Her case, which has remained unsolved for decades, is a perplexing puzzle that has intrigued both investigators and those fascinated by unsolved mysteries. Paula lived in Stamford, Connecticut, with her family when not at school. 
known for her artistic talent and love for the outdoors. She was a multifaceted personality, deeply involved in various artistic mediums, and an avid guitar player. Her interests spanned across art and botany, reflecting her diverse passions. The mystery began unfolding in the winter of 1946. On December 1st, Paula finished her shifts at the university's dining hall and decided to embark on a hiking trip. This decision would mark the start of a mystery that still lingers today. She was last seen leaving her dorm at Dewey Hall when she briefly discussed her hiking plans with her roommate. Despite being dressed for the day's weather, Paula's preparations for the hike were minimal. Notably, she left behind most of her money, including a check from her parents, and set off without necessary hiking gear like extra clothing or a backpack. Around 2.30 p.m., Paula left the campus. She was seen hitchhiking and was picked up by Louis Knapp, a local contractor. She informed him that her destination was the Long Trail, off Route 6 near Glastonbury Mountain. Knapp dropped her off about two and a half miles from the start of the trail. The last confirmed sighting of Paula was at approximately 4 p.m. when she interacted with a group of hikers. She asked them about the length of the trail, learning that it stretched all the way to Canada. After this conversation, she continued her journey northward, venturing into the densely wooded area as dusk set in. Paula's disappearance became apparent when she failed to return. Initially, her roommate thought she had gone to study post-hike, but as hours turned into a night without Paula's return, concern grew. The university was notified, but there was a delay in informing Paula's family, losing critical early hours in the search for her. What followed was a massive search operation involving students, volunteers, National Guard troops, firefighters, and extensive ground and aerial searches. Despite combing through the long trail and its surrounding areas, no trace of Paula was found. The investigation faced challenges due to the absence of a state police force in Vermont at the time. It was only after Paula's father, an influential industrial engineer, exerted pressure on the authorities that more resources were allocated to the investigation. Investigators, including Dorothy Scoville and Robert Rundle, interviewed numerous witnesses and locals, trying to piece together the last known movements of Paula. Adding to the mystery is this case's connection to the Bennington Triangle, a term coined by author Joseph A. Citro. This area, in southwest Vermont, known for a series of unexplained disappearances between 1945 and 1950, includes Paula's disappearance as one of its most prominent. The mystery of Paula's disappearance remains unsolved. If alive, she would be 94 years old today. Her case stands as a reminder of the limitations of mid-20th century investigative techniques and continues to captivate those interested in the mysteries of our world. The perplexing case of Paula Jean Weldon, who vanished in 1946 while hiking in Vermont, serves as a reminder of the mysteries that still exist in our world. Her disappearance, which has remained unsolved for decades, highlights several key lessons. It reminds us of the unpredictability and potential dangers of the wilderness, even for those familiar with local trails. Paula's case underscores the importance of preparation and caution when embarking on outdoor activities, especially in isolated areas. Additionally, her story brings to light the challenges of search and rescue efforts in an era before advanced technology and GPS tracking. It also illustrates the enduring pain faced by families of missing persons, a heartache that lasts long after the initial search efforts have faded. Paula's case, shrouded in speculation and mystery, also teaches us the value of evidence-based investigation and the dangers of conjecture without solid proof. It is a testament to the fact that, despite advances in technology and forensics, some mysteries remain unsolved, leaving us with more questions than answers. Paula Jean Weldon's disappearance is a somber narrative that continues to resonate with us, reminding us of our vulnerabilities and the profound mystery that our world still holds. As we explore this and other mysteries, we invite you to share your thoughts and theories in the comments below.
The mysterious disappearance of Gilbert Mark Gilman in 2006 is a story that intertwines elements of intrigue, expertise, and unsolved puzzles. Gilbert, a man with a background rich in military and intelligence experience, vanished under circumstances that defy easy explanation, leaving behind a trail of questions and theories. Born on November 26, 1958, Gilbert was 47 years old when he would vanish, seemingly without a trace, from Washington's Olympic National Park. His life up to that point was a tapestry of academic and professional achievements. He was a product of esteemed institutions like the London School of Economics, Union College in New York, and the Salve Business School in Brussels. Beyond his academic achievements, Gilbert's career was marked by a distinguished tenure in the U.S. Army as a paratrooper. His service record spanned various global hotspots, Panama, East Africa, and Israel. In these regions, he wasn't just another soldier. He was part of the elite 82nd Airborne Division, a unit renowned for its bravery and skill, where he earned not one, but two bronze stars. His military career extended into realms that few tread, counterterrorism and counterintelligence, areas where stakes are high and the margin for error is virtually non-existent. Gilbert was also a military interrogator in Iraq, a role that demanded the highest levels of mental acuity and resilience. In a testament to his adaptability and intelligence, he was fluent in Arabic, Russian, and Chinese, languages that are pivotal in intelligence operations. Gilbert's disappearance on June 24, 2006 was as perplexing as it was unexpected. That morning, he embarked on a journey to Olympic National Park, a place he knew like the back of his hand. His plan was simple, a casual walk on the Staircase Rapids Loop Trail, a familiar and easy-to-hike 2.1-mile route to take photographs. But what transpired next would turn this ordinary excursion into an enduring mystery. Later that day, park ranger Sinai Lustig encountered Gilbert in his silver Ford Thunderbird near the Staircase Ranger Station. They had a brief and seemingly mundane exchange about the loud music coming from his car. Little did she know, this exchange would be pivotal. Gilbert was never seen again after this encounter. When Gilbert failed to show up for a critical meeting in Spokane, Washington the following day, alarm bells rang. This absence was highly uncharacteristic for a man of Gilbert's discipline and professionalism. Sandy Matheson, the director of the State Department of Retirement Systems, where Gilbert worked, immediately reported him missing. The discovery of Gilbert's car at the Staircase Ranger Station a few days later triggered a massive search operation. For 10 days, 62 search and rescue professionals, equipped with the latest technology and aided by tracking dogs, scoured the area. They deployed a helicopter and a plane equipped with heat-seeking thermal imaging in a desperate attempt to locate any sign of Gilbert. But in a turn as baffling as his disappearance, the search yielded nothing. No trace of Gilbert was found, not even the slightest clue to hint at its fate. Park Ranger Michael Denisowish, who led the search operation, expressed the depths of their efforts and the frustration at the lack of results. They considered every possibility, every decision Gilbert might have made, every route he might have taken, but every theory led to a dead end. The circumstances of Gilbert's disappearance were a paradox. The trail was well marked and short. It seemed inconceivable that a man with Gilbert's extensive survival training could lose his way. The possibility of a health complication or an animal attack seemed equally unlikely as no evidence supporting these scenarios was found. Theories about what happened to Gilbert abound, each more mysterious than the last. Some, including his mother Doris Gilman, speculated that he might have been recruited for government CIA activities necessitating his disappearance. Another chilling theory linked his case to Israel Keyes, a known serial killer with a history of burying kill kits in national parks and choosing victims at random. Keyes' presence in the vicinity of the park around the time of Gilbert's disappearance lent some credence to this theory, but like the others, it remained unconfirmed. 
Gilbert's story remains a puzzling enigma. With no concrete evidence or clear leads, his fate is shrouded in mystery, leaving room for endless speculation and theories. His case is a haunting reminder of how quickly and mysteriously someone can vanish, leaving behind nothing but questions and a legacy of enduring mystery. Welcome to a universe of mystery where we delve deep into the most bewildering and unexplained mysteries of our world. Today, we're exploring two perplexing cases that have baffled experts and intrigued mystery enthusiasts alike. The disappearances of Frederick Fritz Drum and Thomas Messick Sr. These stories, set against the backdrop of the enigmatic wilderness of upstate New York, converge in a narrative that challenges our understanding of the natural world. As we unravel the layers of these mysterious cases, we invite you to join us on this journey through the unknown. If you're captivated by these intriguing stories and want to stay updated with more mysteries from around the universe, please like, share, and subscribe to our channel. Don't forget to hit that notification bell so you never miss out on our latest explorations into the unexplained. And for those who are particularly moved by these mysteries and wish to support the channel further, consider using the Super Chat feature. Your contributions help us delve deeper into these mysteries and bring even more fascinating content to you. Every bit of support fuels our journey into the mysterious and the unknown. So let's embark on this adventure together and uncover the secrets that await us. In the vast, untamed wilderness of upstate New York, where nature's beauty intertwines with the unknown, lie two stories, both profoundly mysterious and eerily similar. These are the tales of Frederick Fritz Drum and Thomas Messick Sr., two men whose disappearances from familiar terrains defy easy explanation and challenge our understanding of the natural world. Their stories, seemingly separate, converge in a narrative that is as baffling as it is intriguing, set against the backdrop of a region steeped in enigma and mystery. The parallels between the two cases are striking and unsettling. Both men were experienced in outdoor survival, well acquainted with their surroundings, and held in high regard by their respective communities. Their sudden and unexplained vanishings from areas they knew well add a perplexing layer to their stories. The lack of any evidence or clues in such thoroughly searched areas deepen the mystery. What's more, these disappearances occurred in a region that borders the infamous Bennington Triangle, an area notorious for a series of unexplained vanishings. This geographical connection weaves a thread of intrigue and speculation, suggesting a possible link to the larger mysteries of the Triangle and the puzzles that are often associated with it. As we delve into these two stories, we are drawn into a world where the line between the known and unknown is blurred. Their tales are not just isolated incidents, they are a part of a larger, more complex puzzle that challenges our perception of reality and the mysteries that lie hidden in the wilderness. Through the convergence of these two stories, we embark on a journey to explore the depths of these mysteries, seeking answers that remain just out of reach. It was a crisp November morning in 2015 when 82-year-old Thomas Messick Sr., an adept and respected woodsman, ventured into the dense forests of Horicon, New York, near Bryant Lake. This area, cloaked in the rich hues of autumn, was familiar territory for Thomas, who had spent countless seasons navigating its rugged terrain. His planned activity was deer hunting, a ritual he had engaged in annually with a blend of passion and expertise. Yet this year, the forest held a different fate for him, one shrouded in mystery and unanswered questions. Thomas wasn't just an ordinary hunter. His profound knowledge of the wilderness was augmented by years of experience, making him more than adept at navigating and surviving in the wild. His wisdom in these areas was not only practiced, but also taught to others, showcasing his deep understanding of forest survival. On that fateful day, Thomas was part of a group of seven, a mix of friends and family, all united by their love for hunting. They congregated near Lily Pond, a tranquil body of water that served as their chosen hunting ground. Their strategy was a classic deer drive, a technique requiring coordination and teamwork. 
The group was divided into two. The drivers, tasked with stirring the deer from their hiding spots, and the watchers, positioned strategically to capitalize on the fleeing game. Thomas, along with three elder members of the party, assumed the role of the watchers. They positioned themselves in a linear formation, maintaining a distance of less than 100 yards from each other. This careful positioning was meant to ensure visibility and communication within the group, an essential aspect of the hunt. As the day progressed, the drivers moved through the forest, pushing the deer towards the watchers. However, they were met with an eerie silence, an unusual stillness that seemed to have engulfed the forest. The natural chorus of wildlife sounds was conspicuously absent, creating an unsettling atmosphere. Upon reaching the location where Thomas was supposed to be, a wave of confusion and concern washed over the group. Thomas was nowhere in sight. His absence was alarming, especially considering his extensive background in wilderness survival. The immediate vicinity offered no clues. His rifle and walkie-talkie, essential tools for communication and protection, were missing as well. The group initiated a search, scouring the area for any sign of Thomas, but to no avail. As the daylight waned, they contacted the forest rangers, sparking the beginning of a large-scale search operation. The operation stretched into the evening, with part of the group staying behind overnight to make noise in hopes of guiding Thomas back. The search for Thomas Messick Sr. quickly escalated into an extensive and thorough operation. Starting the next day, a team of 13 trained rescue professionals from the Park Service joined the effort. This was only the beginning of a search that would grow to involve over 300 individuals, including professionals and volunteers. They were equipped with an arsenal of search tools, dogs, divers, helicopters, all scouring an area spanning over four square miles. Even with such an extensive effort, no evidence or trace of Thomas was uncovered. The involvement of the FBI's critical incident response group in the search added an element of intrigue. The FBI's presence was unusual, given their standard protocols for missing person cases. Their secretive approach and lack of transparent communication fueled speculation and rumors about the nature of their interest in this case. As days turned into weeks, the mystery only deepened. The lack of any trace of Thomas, coupled with his survival skills and the proximity of his last known location to the rest of the group, made his disappearance all the more perplexing. The area was extensively combed, yet it seemed as if Thomas had just vanished into thin air. Theories were proposed, yet none provided a satisfactory explanation. Was it a sudden medical emergency, an unexpected encounter with wildlife, or something more sinister? The absence of any distress signal, especially considering Thomas's access to a walkie-talkie, only added to the complexity of the case. The puzzle of Thomas Messick Sr.'s disappearance remains unsolved to this day. The forest that was once his hunting ground has become the setting of a profound mystery, one that continues to captivate and baffle. Despite the passage of time, questions linger. What happened to Thomas on that November day? Why did he leave his post? And where could he have ventured off to? The lack of evidence, the thoroughness of the search, and Thomas's expertise in the wilderness combined to create a narrative that is as confounding as it is intriguing. His story stands as a testament to the unpredictable nature of the wild and the mysteries that it still holds. In the tranquil expanse of Schulerville, New York, a small town known for its beauty and proximity to the notorious Bennington Triangle, the unexplained disappearance of 68-year-old Frederick Fritz Drum on November 24, 2015, cast a long, unsettling shadow. This mystery, entwined with the similar, perplexing case of Thomas Messick Sr., forms a tapestry of unanswered questions and eerie coincidences. Frederick Drum, a man deeply rooted in his community, lived with his wife Ruth on a vast 178-acre farm. Their life there was idyllic, set against the backdrop of upstate New York's rolling hills and landscapes. Fritz, an accomplished hunter and lover of the outdoors, had adapted well to the region's harsh winters. He spent his retirement days exploring the property, observing wildlife, and tracking animals along the creek that meandered through their land. 
His mental faculties were sharp, with no indications of dementia or cognitive decline. Fritz's contributions to his community extended beyond his love for nature. For 14 years, he had served diligently on Schulerville's city council. His decisions were fair, and he was both liked and respected, a testament to his character and integrity. On the day Fritz vanished, it began like any other. He and Ruth shared a morning coffee, a ritual embodying the simplicity and comfort of their long-shared life. Ruth left for a grandparent's breakfast at 10 a.m., while Fritz preferred the solace of their farm. When she returned at 2 p.m., the barn was empty, and Fritz was nowhere to be found. His belongings, including his cell phone and car keys, were inside the house, suggesting that he hadn't gone far. As darkness fell upon the farm and Fritz did not return, Ruth's concern turned into alarm. By the next morning, with Fritz still missing, she reported his disappearance, igniting a large-scale search. The Saratoga County Sheriff's Department, alongside over 200 volunteers, search and rescue teams, helicopters, and canine units embarked on an exhaustive search. They combed through the drum property and expanded their efforts to an astounding 1,200 acres surrounding the area. Despite this extensive and thorough search, no evidence of Fritz's whereabouts emerged. It was as if he had vanished into the ether, leaving behind a baffling mystery that echoed the strange disappearance of Thomas Messick Sr., who had vanished under similarly mysterious circumstances in the same region just one year before. The proximity of these two cases, both geographically and culturally, paints a picture of a region shrouded in mystery. Schulerville's closeness to the Bennington Triangle, an area notorious for unexplained disappearances, only deepens this intrigue. Some speculate there might be a connection between these disappearances and the mysterious forces often attributed to the Triangle. The shared characteristics of Fritz's and Thomas's case are striking. Both were experienced outdoorsmen, well respected in their communities, with no known reasons to vanish voluntarily. Their disappearances from locations where they were familiar and comfortable without any trace, challenges, logical explanations. The involvement of extensive search teams, the use of modern technology, and the lack of any clues or evidence add layers of complexity to this case. The absence of any signs of a struggle, foul play, or intention to leave raises more questions than answers. The region's wilderness, while beautiful, holds secrets that seem beyond the grasp of those who seek to uncover them. Since the years of their disappearances have passed, their stories remain open chapters in unexplained mysteries. Families, communities, and investigators continue to grapple with the unknown, holding onto the hope that someday, some light may be shed on these perplexing cases. The disappearances of Frederick Fritz Drum and Thomas Messick Sr. stands as reminders of the profound mysteries that lie within the natural world, silent and yet to be unraveled. As we reach the end of our exploration into these puzzling disappearances, we are left with more questions than answers. These cases, unfolding in the vast wilderness of upstate New York, serve as reminders of the mysteries that still elude our understanding. Despite extensive searches and the passage of time, the fates of Fritz and Thomas remain shrouded in mystery, their stories a testament to the unpredictability and profound mysteries of nature. As we continue to ponder their disappearances, these cases remind us of the fragility of our existence against the backdrop of the natural world. They stand as enduring mysteries, captivating and confounding us, and reminding us that some secrets of the universe are perhaps destined to remain unsolved. The Mysterious Disappearance of Philip Taylor Kramer Once a prominent figure in the rock music scene as the bass guitarist for Iron Butterfly, evolved into one of the most perplexing and puzzling cases in recent history. His vanishing on February 12, 1995, followed by the grim discovery of his remains four years later in the desolate Malibu Ravine, has fueled countless theories, ranging from the plausible to the outlandish, each struggling to make sense of the inexplicable events. 
Kramer's life before his disappearance was a study in contrasts. From the psychedelic highs of rock stardom with Iron Butterfly in the 1970s, he transitioned to the cerebral world of aerospace engineering, demonstrating remarkable intellectual prowess. His academic journey, characterized by top grades, led him to a significant position at Northrop, working on the MX missile guidance system as a Department of Defense contractor. This transition from the arts to the sciences was not just a career change. It was a transformation that later became a focal point in the mystery surrounding his disappearance. The day Kramer vanished, he was set to perform a seemingly mundane task, picking up a business associate and his wife from Los Angeles International Airport. However, this routine errand took a bizarre turn. After abruptly leaving the airport, Kramer initiated a series of mysterious and unsettling phone calls. He contacted his former bandmate, Ron Bushy, delivering the cryptic and haunting message, I'll see you on the other side. His call to police was even more alarming, as he stated his intention to commit suicide and inexplicably connected his fate to O.J. Simpson's innocence. Kramer's disappearance led to a four-year void filled with speculation and unanswered questions. The discovery of his remains in May of 1999 and his 1993 Ford Aerostar van, which lay at the bottom of Decker Canyon, added a chilling and perplexing chapter to this story. Decker Canyon, a remote and rugged area near Malibu, known for its dense vegetation and isolation, seemed almost tailor-made for concealing secrets. The discovery made by Walter Lockwood, a fitness instructor interested in old abandoned cars, revealed the van in a state of severe damage, suggesting a violent end. The mystery surrounding Kramer's case is multifaceted, encompassing his intellectual endeavors, his sudden behavioral changes, and the bizarre circumstances of his disappearance and death. A brilliant mind, Kramer was deeply immersed in the realms of theoretical physics and advanced mathematics interests that veered toward the obsessive. His preoccupation with theories of intergalactic communication and transportation painted a picture of a man engrossed in ideas far beyond the ordinary. In the period leading up to his disappearance, Kramer was reportedly consumed with developing a secretive and potentially groundbreaking formula. This formula, believed by Kramer and his father, Ray Kramer, to have the capacity to overturn established physics, involved concepts of faster-than-light communication, an idea that defied the foundations of contemporary scientific understanding. Ray Kramer, himself a former engineering professor, added to the intrigue with claims of a universal equation capable of unraveling the universe's most profound mysteries, from black holes to quantum mechanics. Kramer's intense dedication to his work coincided with noticeable changes in his behavior. He spoke of being in imminent danger, expressed the need for heightened security, and shared cryptic insights about otherworldly phenomena. Conversations about supernovas, telepathic messages, and cryptic insights into other dimensions raised serious concerns about his psychological state. In the aftermath of his disappearance, numerous theories emerged to explain the unexplainable. Some hypothesized about mind control, while others thought that Kramer's advanced knowledge and discoveries made him a target for secretive agencies or foreign powers. His sister Kathleen openly doubted the identity of the remains found in the van, hinting at a more extensive conspiracy. Various investigators, colleagues, and friends reflected on the strange circumstances surrounding the case, while some suggested that Kramer had stumbled upon something significant and potentially dangerous. Despite the official conclusion of probable suicide, many aspects of Philip Taylor Kramer's disappearance and his death remain puzzling, shrouded in a cloud of mystery. His story, weaving together elements of rock history, advanced scientific exploration, and the eerie circumstances of his final hours continue to captivate and baffle. The true narrative behind Kramer's tragic end remains a complex mystery of theories, each as unresolved as the next. In the remote and rugged landscape of Canada's Northwest Territories, a story unfolded in June of 2005 that would perplex and haunt the small community of Fort Simpson and beyond. David Horsey and Frederick Hardesty 
Two friends known for their inseparability and shared passion for the wilderness embarked on what was supposed to be a serene retreat to a cabin about 70 miles northwest of Fort Simpson. Little did anyone know this journey would lead them into a puzzling situation, leaving more questions than answers and turning a peaceful getaway into a mystery. The cabin, nestled along the serene North Nahani River, was their chosen sanctuary. It was in this isolated location that the story took a turn towards the inexplicable. When the cabin owner visited on June 12th to check on them, both men were reportedly in good spirits, enjoying the tranquility of their surroundings. However, when he returned four days later, David and Frederick had vanished without a trace. The cabin showed no signs of a hurried or forced departure. Their firearms were left behind, and there was an abundance of food and shelter. The scene painted a picture of calm, sharply contrasting with their sudden and unexplained absence. As word of their disappearance spread, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police launched an extensive search operation, employing thermal imaging and scouring the area around the North Nahani River. Despite their efforts, the mystery only deepened. On June 28th, the CBC reported a grim development. David Horsey's body was discovered deep in the bush, over two miles from the cabin. The condition of his body was peculiar, intact, but with unexplained burns on his hands and arms. This discovery raised more questions than it answered. How did David end up so far from the cabin, and what caused these burns? The plot thickened ten days later when Frederick's body was found, this time in the North Nahani River, about twelve miles from the cabin. Like David, Frederick was found in an area that had been thoroughly searched. The fact that both men were found in locations that had been previously scoured by the search teams added a layer of intrigue. Were they placed there after the initial searches, or had they just been missed in the rugged and challenging terrain? The lack of evidence of foul play further complicated the case. However, family members and members of the search party painted a different picture of the cabin scene. Contrary to the initial claims, they described a scene of chaos, firearms discharged seemingly in a panic, with one shot leaving a hole in the floor. This revelation contradicted the police's statements of no apparent problems at the cabin and suggested a scenario of fear or confrontation. In 2018, family members called for the case to be reopened, expressing dissatisfaction with the initial investigation. They questioned the thoroughness of the police work and sought answers for the many lingering questions. The official causes of death were hypothermia for David and drowning for Frederick. This did little to clarify the circumstances leading to their demise. This story, shrouded in mystery, leaves us grappling with numerous unanswered questions. What transpired in the cabin that led to such a chaotic scene? Why did the men leave the safety and supplies of the cabin? What led to David's burns, and why were both bodies found in areas that had been previously searched? The possibility of a third party's involvement, the nature of the threat they faced, and the reasons behind their separation are all aspects that remain in the realm of speculation. The mysterious disappearances and subsequent deaths of David Horsey and Frederick Hardesty in the Northwest Territories of Canada present a haunting puzzle. With no clear answers and only fragments of information, their story remains an unsolved mystery, a reminder of the unpredictability of the wilderness and the enduring puzzles and mysteries that can arise from its depths. In the serene yet mysterious setting of the North Cascades National Park, a perplexing case unfolded that continues to confound investigators and the public alike. The story began at the Colonial Creek Campground, where National Park Service Rangers reported a vehicle, a Honda Element, that had remained parked in the area for several weeks. This vehicle belonged to Richie Collins, a 58-year-old father and a veteran with 23 years of military service, including experience in Border and Customs Patrol. Richie, standing at six foot one and weighing around 275 pounds, was not known for his outdoor pursuits like camping or hiking. He had health concerns, including high blood pressure and a bad knee, making the location of this vehicle in such a remote area even more puzzling. The vehicle, with the keys left on the roof, showed no signs of having been tampered with. 
and a map of the Cascade Mountains lay open on the passenger seat, a silent witness to an untold plan or journey. The search for Richie was extensive. Brittany Collins, Richie's daughter, reported that the Rangers conducted a thorough search within a seven-mile radius of the vehicle, employing cadaver canine units. The Colonial Creek campground, known for its deep reservoir, was even dredged in the hunt for any sign of Collins, but the search yielded no results. The mystery deepened upon the discovery of Richie's apartment. Over 35 weapons from his large firearm collection were missing, yet the gun cases were left behind in disarray, suggesting a ransacking. Further oddities in the apartment included bleach left on the counter and a crammed dishwasher, indicating a hasty or disturbed departure. Richie's daughter suspected that his collection had been stolen and his car abandoned in the area by the perpetrator or perpetrators. Randy, Rich's brother, was the one that found the apartment in complete disarray, which was highly uncharacteristic of Richie, known for his meticulous nature. Additionally, Richie's computer was missing, adding another layer of intrigue to the case. Reports on Richie's last sighting were conflicting, with some placing him leaving his home with a small book bag in early March or late April. There was evidence suggesting that his gun safe had been pried open, though detectives theorized that this might have been done by Collins himself. In a turn of events, the professional estate manager and trustee who took over Richie's property swiftly sold off all his belongings and his home, effectively halting any potential for future private investigations. The case took a grim turn on July 6th when children discovered partial remains near the Colonial Creek Campground in the North Cascades, about five miles from the parking lot at Diablo Lake where Richie's car was found. Among the remains, some of Collins' belongings were identified, but notably his head was missing. The state of these remains and the missing head added a chilling aspect to an already mysterious case. Collins's case bears eerie resemblances to other disappearances in the area. His physical condition and lack of outdoor experience made an extensive hike in the rugged terrain highly unlikely. Furthermore, his neighbors reported last seeing him in the middle of April, adding to the timeline confusion. The North Cascades, particularly around Diablo Lake, has been the site of other unsettling disappearances. For instance, in October of 2020, Alexander Pitch vanished after setting up an easel to paint a landscape near the lake. His remains have never been found. The area around Collins' abandoned vehicle was thoroughly searched by rescue teams, yet no trail or sign of him was found. The cadaver dogs that were also deployed in the search failed to pick up any scent of Collins. The lack of any concrete leads or evidence in this search leaves many questions unanswered. The case of Richie Collins not only underscores the unpredictability of wilderness areas, but also teaches us several crucial lessons. It highlights the importance of leaving detailed plans and informing others when venturing into remote locations, regardless of one's experience. The case also serves as a reminder of the critical role of timely and thorough investigations in missing person cases, especially when unusual circumstances are evident. Additionally, it underscores the value of preserving personal property and belongings during investigations as they might hold key evidence or insights. For family members and friends of individuals who go missing, this case exemplifies the importance of advocacy and persistence in seeking answers and ensuring a comprehensive investigation. As we reflect on the mysterious disappearance and tragic fate of Richie Collins, we are reminded of the need for caution, preparedness, and the importance of community awareness in the face of such unexplained mysteries. The Disappearance of Tom Simon Seth, a 66-year-old man from Mount Vernon, unfolded into a profound mystery in the rugged wilderness of the North Cascades. Simon Seth, described by his friends as athletic and well acquainted with the outdoors, had embraced hiking as a retirement pursuit, inspired by two close friends. His familiarity with the Hidden Lake Trail was well established, and he had attempted the trail multiple times, but was often deterred by snow. On May 22nd, Simon Set set out to conquer the Hidden Lake Trail once again. He informed his wife of his plans, promising to return by 7 p.m. that night. During his hike, he encountered two other hikers who had decided to turn back due to worsening conditions further up the trail. 
It is speculated that Simon Seth may have followed their footprints, choosing to turn back as the snow conditions deteriorated. When Simon Seth failed to return home, his wife reported him missing. Two of his friends, both experienced in mountaineering and with over 20 years of search and rescue experience, immediately began searching for him. Knowing that Simon Seth was ill-equipped to survive a night in the harsh conditions, they rushed to the trailhead, finding his car still parked there. They searched tirelessly until midnight and resumed at first light of the next dawn. The search for Simon Seth quickly escalated, with search and rescue teams from multiple jurisdictions joining the effort. The U.S. Border Patrol and the Navy also participated, while helicopters from Spokane County surveyed the area from above. Ground teams meticulously combed the challenging terrain, looking for any sign of an avalanche or tree wells where Simon Seth might have been caught. The search efforts, however, were hampered by snow and reduced visibility, presenting significant challenges to the rescue teams. Despite these obstacles, the search continued for several days. On July 29th of 2021, a major development occurred when the Snohomish County Sheriff's helicopter team recovered remains believed to be those of Simon Seth. However, formal identification was still pending at the time. The case of Tom Simon Seth, marked by its suddenness and challenging conditions of the terrain, is a stark reminder of the unpredictable nature of the wilderness. His disappearance shortly after encountering other hikers and in the vicinity of where others had vanished added to the complexity and tragedy of the situation. The search efforts, although extensive and involving multiple agencies, were fraught with natural obstacles, highlighting the difficulties faced in wilderness search and rescue operations. This story is an example of the inherent risks in outdoor activities, even for those experienced and familiar with the environments. It underscores the importance of preparation, the unpredictable nature of mountain weather, and the need for caution when venturing into such areas. Tom's disappearance and the subsequent search efforts serve as a reminder of how quickly situations can change in the wilderness and the crucial importance of safety and preparedness in outdoor adventures. As we reach the end of today's captivating exploration into some of the most mysterious and intriguing cases, I want to take a moment to sincerely thank each of you, my dedicated audience on this channel. Your commitment to journeying through these intricate and often perplexing stories is not only appreciated, but also a vital part of what makes this channel so special. It's your engagement, your curiosity, and your thirst for unraveling the unknown that make our community a unique space for exploring the mysteries of our world. Today's journey through the unexplained has, no doubt, been a complex one. As we've delved into these stories, we've encountered more questions than answers, and it's this pursuit of understanding and the unknown that ties us all together in this fascinating journey. Your presence here, making it through the entire video, shows a dedication that is both rare and invaluable in the quest for knowledge and understanding. If you've found yourself intrigued, moved, or even a bit perplexed by these stories we've shared, I encourage you to express your support. You can do this by liking, sharing, and subscribing to A Universe of Mystery. Each like, share, and new subscription helps our community grow and allows us to dive even deeper into the intriguing mysteries that our world has to offer. Also, remember to hit that notification bell. It's the best way to ensure you won't miss out on any of the exciting content I have lined up. I've got a lot of thrilling explorations ahead, and I promise you, you don't want to miss them. For those of you who feel a deeper connection to these stories and wish to support the channel further, consider contributing through a YouTube Super Chat. Your contributions, no matter how big or small, are incredibly meaningful. They empower my quest to bring you high-quality, thought-provoking content, and also to uncover the secrets hidden in the shadows of our mysterious universe. Your support fuels my passion and helps keep my flame of curiosity burning bright. As we wrap up today's journey, like some of the stories, I'm reminded about the power of community. Here at A Universe of Mystery, it's more than just sharing stories. It's about building a space where curiosity leads the way, and the pursuit of the unknown binds us together. So, thank you once again for being part of this community and part of my journey. Your presence, engagement, and support make all the difference. Stay curious, stay open-minded, and keep exploring the depths of our incredible universe with me. Until next time, 
Take care and keep the mystery alive.